and welcome back to Tuesday at Dobbs's. A change of scenery. We're back in the UK. This is Monica's apartment in Ipswich, where I think we'll be staying probably for the next four weeks, probably four weeks or so until we finally get a property of our own. So welcome back to the UK. It feels lovely to be back. You know, I took some advice. In last week's podcast episode, someone said, Freddie, I know you said the roads in the southeast of England may not be famous for being the best riding roads, but they head out at the break of dawn. This listener from last week said they head out at the break of dawn, southeast England, on a Saturday or Sunday morning before all of the cars get out. And they said it is the most brilliant time to ride. Well, I took you up on that advice. 830 Sunday morning, so just two days ago. In fact, sorry, just, yeah, just two days ago. Headed off with a friend of mine, Danny, in Ipswich. We met up at Starbucks at 8.30. This may sound pathetic, but this is one of the, the earliest times I've ever headed off on a ride. I'm actually an early, an early riser in general. But for some reason, I don't know if it's because I think just everyone prefers having a bit of a lion. I always end up doing a ride maybe at 11 o'clock, sometimes even one or two in the afternoon. So getting up at 8.30 or getting out for a ride at 8.30 was something quite new to me. Met up, had a coffee, and we headed off. And the roads were completely empty. I mean, I know I'm stating the obvious here, but getting out before the traffic, it was a complete revelation. So before we headed off, Danny told me that he had just downloaded an app called the Cali Moto app, if I just rewind about 20 minutes. And that is a motorcycle specific app. And this isn't sponsored at all. I've heard of this Cali Moto app, but I've never considered using it before, not for any reason at all. So Danny had downloaded the app. He's using the free version of it. So it means that you just get to see the southern point of the UK and you don't get the super twisty roads. You just get the meandering roads. So it can be even better. But he set up a point on the coast for us to head to and it set up a one hour route. So he put our end destination. We wanted to get to the beach. And then Kalimoto generates a route specifically to be the most fun riding route. So no motorways, no dual carriageways, the most winding roads you can imagine. And I have to take back all of my words saying that the southeast of England and the east of England is not that good for winding roads, real biking roads. I've never seen so many brilliant winding roads outside of Italy. This is northern France level, even mid France level of beautiful, endless winding roads that I would have no idea existed if we weren't using the Kalimoto app. So it was blue sky, 17 degrees, no other vehicles on the road apart from clearly all of the other bikers and classic car enthusiasts who were on the road. So we were going around these empty, stunning country lanes, passing thatched cottages, 500 year old buildings dotted along tiny, beautiful villages that I had never seen in my life. And I would never see if it weren't thanks to Kalimoto and just passing by different bikes, Harley Davidson's, Honda Fireblades, beautiful old Moto Goodsies, everyone out with the same idea. And we got to the coast, probably at about 11 o'clock or something, had a coffee, had a chat, headed back in time for lunch. This is now going to be a routine for me. Early weekend morning rides. I, I think honestly, it's one of the most fun rides in the UK I've ever had in my life. And it was all within 30 miles of here, even the coast where we ended up. I think it's about 34, 35 miles from here, that's it. But the route the Cali Moto takes you it turns it into an adventure. And I think it's available globally. Honestly, I need to actually get the app now and pay for it. I don't care what it costs, it's totally worth it. If anyone's looking for something to improve the riding enjoyment, get this app. It's a complete game changer. Right, I move on. In fact, I tell you what, let me just carry on in that vein of the joy that biking can bring. So I've got a couple of things here. A lot of people were, were saying, yeah, you've got to get out early morning for a ride. And, and now I get it. 
This person said, and sorry I didn't save your name, but my uncle used to say that he loved getting up early because you breathe the air that no one has breathed yet. Someone else, hi Freddie, just watched last week's video and the first section really struck a chord with me. At the age of 37 last year, having never sat on a motorbike, I decided to book my CBT and order a Mutt Mastiff 125. I managed to pass my assessment in one day after a slightly wobbly start, to be expected. I spent a few months building my confidence on quiet roads and decided to book my direct access five-day course. After some silly mistakes, mainly overtaking, after some silly mistakes, mainly overthinking, sorry, I passed my Mod 2 cleanly and gained my full license. I'm now the proud owner of a Royal Enfield Classic 350 Signals Edition in Marsh Grey, and I'm loving being able to go further afield and not be limited to smaller roads. I came to the conclusion very quickly that I should have got a bike years ago, although I do feel, having driven a car for 20 years, that I'm more cautious regarding other road users. I'm so glad and that I didn't wait any longer to become a biker. I'm looking forward to many years of exploring the roads, both home and abroad. Thank you and all of the listeners for their wise words and advice. Andy. Andy, fantastic to hear it. Here's to many, many happy years riding. Uh, And I continue, I move on. You can sit, oh, this is with regards to motorbiking safety. I quite like this. Uh, Freddie, you can sit in a padded room and hope to eliminate all risk from your personal life, but the megalomaniacs ruling the world are pushing us ever closer to nuclear Armageddon. So you may as well just throw caution to the wind and live it up. I move on to Dale. Freddie, speaking as someone with a rare blood disorder and knowing that if I fall off my bike, I won't get up. It doesn't stop me, but motivates me to keep going because riding gives me so much joy and keeps me sane. The risk pales in comparison with the benefits. I've had many a consultant look in horror when I pop my helmet down at the appointment and I know what they are about to say. And as I always say, I can fall down the stairs at home easier than falling off a bike. Life is for living, plus bike parking is free. While ever I am well enough, I will ride, rain or shine, I rode to Edinburgh for a Greggs one morning. That's a 550 mile round trip just because I could and I wanted to. Dale. Dale, I need to do that one time. Just a ridiculously gigantic ride in a day. 550 miles for a Greg's pastry. Brilliant. Okay, this. This is something that piqued my interest. I, I like looking through. I've got a Readly app, and it basically means I can look at loads of old motorbike magazines. And I was flicking through a couple of days ago at the airport in, I think it was Singapore, And I was looking through Bike Magazine. Bike Magazine is one of my favorite biking magazines. And it goes all the way back, the back editions, to 2016. And it got me thinking, because used bike prices are very, very strong at the moment. Really very strong. So I wanted to see, if I go back six years, how much have bike prices changed? So I went through and I have got a list of five motorbikes. And the price that those motorbikes were when brand new in May 2017. So that is exactly six years ago. Have a listen to this. BMW R9T Pure. The price when new six years ago, £9,990. I'll put pics up here so you can see. The price now for, again, a 2017 BMW R9T Pure for second hand, £6,500. I mean, that means that you've just lost £3,400 in six years. That's a depreciation of £500 a year. £500 a year, it's nothing at all. Even the more expensive motorbikes, Harley Davidson Softail Slim, £17,795 when brand new, used for a 2017 model, 13,500 pounds. You're just losing 400 pounds in, in six years. Okay, then I thought, okay, 
let's find something that I think will be a big depreciator. And if you want a big depreciator, you usually have to go for the really big, expensive bikes. And I won't go for a Harley because I know Harleys hold their value well. So I went for a Honda Goldwing GL1800. Six years ago, brand new, this was £23,499 and used now £15,400. That means even for a gigantically expensive gold ring, you've only lost about £8,000. It's still only depreciation of around about £1,000, maybe £1,200 a year. Let me do two final ones here. Japanese, smaller ones. Suzuki SV650, £5,836 when new, used £3,850. That means that you've lost, if you'd have bought it six years ago, just £2,000 in six years. And one final one, Kawasaki W800, £7,000 almost on the dot, used, and this is the best, £5,300. That's a depreciation of £1,700 in six years for a Kawasaki W800. Completely phenomenal. Bikes over cars are, are, are very, very decently solid. Maybe not investment, but a solid purchase because you keep such a huge, relatively speaking, percentage proportion of the original amount that you paid for a bike. It's phenomenal. Right, I move on to Jack. Jack's actually got a, a YouTube channel that I love, Boris the Defender. Um, old, what is it, 1998, I think? Land Rover Defender, goes on lots of adventures. Absolutely love it. Hi, Freddie. I'm very happy to have just swapped. Oh, this interested me. I'm very happy to have just swapped my Scrambler, Triumph Scrambler 1200XC, to a Royal Enfield Classic 350. So going from a, a huge, hugely accomplished 1200cc motorbike and what is, at least on paper, a massive downgrade to a Royal Enfield Classic 350. I continue. I bought the Classic 350 partly down to the good words of yourself and, other, and, and others. I loved the three hour journey home on it. Insurance was just too expensive to have a pillion on the previous bike, so I'm happy now to be able to do that. And this got me thinking, what does Monica wear on the back of the bike? Not specifically brands, um, but more each item. Does she go as far as riding trousers, jacket, gloves? Must be difficult filming with a touchscreen camera or phone in gloves. Cheers, Jack. Yes, Jack, I'll get to your second point first. What Monica wears, if we're going around town exactly the same as me, so just a helmet, and if she's not filming, she'll, she'll often chuck some gloves on, but it's usually, to be honest, into Ipswich, three quarters of a mile away, just a helmet. And if we're going further afield, for example, tomorrow I think we'll do a, a, a 40 minute ride, she will wear Panda Moto jeans, See if I can put these here. Pandamoto jeans, Garibaldi jacket, heritage jacket, Spanish company, Garibaldi open face helmet, and former crystal boots. I'll see if I can put all the details here. That's Monica's setup, and I'll correct myself here. She was wearing the Garibaldi jacket, but she's since changed that because she, she struggled to find jackets that she really enjoyed wearing on and off the bike. So she's now bought a Knox, thin Knox Under Armour, and it means she can just wear any jacket she wants. So Monica's now a big fan of the Under Armour jackets. Very, very thin, low profile, and then she can just wear any of her normal jackets instead of that. So that's what she does. And now let me get back, Jack, to your first point. I have more people than any other bike telling me that either they're getting into biking or they're getting back into biking, or they've refound their passion for biking with one specific bike, the classic 350. This bike is just, I don't know the sales figures, but it sounds to be a phenomenal success. And it brings me to a point. What does good actually mean? If we look at a bike, what is good and how important is it? On paper, good, of course, will be huge horsepower, 
incredible dynamics with the, the best suspension and riding modes and braking distances and everything that you associate good to be. But maybe for bikes over cars, does good actually matter? For me, reliability matters. Yes, I want something reliable. But when you look at old videos of, of bikes and people having fun on bikes, whether it's 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, I never once think, I'm glad now we're in 2023 because I can have more fun on a bike. I look at them and I think these people on bikes that have 20 horsepower are having every bit as much fun as we are now in 2023. I mean, I'm glad it's 2023 because I, I can't deal with a lack of reliability and everything rusting in front of me. So we've got better rust protection, we've got better reliability, as long as you don't get something too complicated. But from a pure fun point of view, other oh, bikes now are no more fun than a bike from 20 years ago, or from 60 years ago. My Triumph Bonneville now is no more fun than my 2002 Suzuki Bandit doesn't have any extra fun factor at all. I prefer it because I think it's a cooler bike in my eyes and I prefer riding it because I love the looks and I feel a connection to it. But blindfold me and put me on my Suzuki Bandit and put me on my Bonneville, there is no difference in my eyes to the level of fun. And I can, put, let me push this further and see if I get people really disagreeing here. Put me on a Suzuki Bandit 2002, 600cc, never, even when it was new, thought of as the, the most fun, most fine handling bike, but put me on that, on the finest roads, whether it's Spain, Italy, or wherever, and put a brand new Ducati sports bike next to it. I honestly don't think I would have any more fun on that Ducati sports bike than I would the Suzuki Bandit. I know the Ducati sports bike is a better bike, but if we're talking just pure fun, no, the Bandit is every bit as fun as the Ducati sports bike. Every single bit is fun. It's the bike that's fun. And that's where bikes are different to cars in my eyes. Jack, thank you for that. I move on to Sean. Ooh, yes. Okay. I, I would love to hear people's thoughts and opinions on this. Freddie, interested to hear your thoughts and those of other listeners. Are maxi scooters a viable alternative to normal motorcycles? With roads more crowded than ever and speed cameras on every corner, are maxi scooters a real life alternative to the bikes that we know and love? High level of comfort, DCT transmission, cheap to run, cheap to insure. Is this the answer? I know I might be slightly biased here as I found a new affection in riding sedately and enjoying the view, but what are your thoughts? Do people tour on maxi scooters? Are there any listeners here who ditched their tourer or even sports bike for the comfort and practicality of a maxi scooter? I'd love to know. Sean, please share it. I would love to see any pics, any stories with people who swear by maxi scooters. After getting back from Southeast Asia, for one, we had these little 150 or 125cc uh, bikes, the little scooters, but then we upgraded to a maxi scooter and they are seriously accomplished bikes. They're fun, they're comfortable, they are ludicrously practical. Open up a seat on a maxi scooter and I think for a lot of them, you can actually fit two helmets in there under the seat. For most of them, in fact, for all of them, you can fit one helmet with comfort and a decent chunk of extra luggage. Of course, you can then put the, the back box on the back if you need it. You've got cubby holes at the front, one on either side of the handlebars. So you put your phone in there, your wallet in that one. Most of them now have a USB that plugs just under the handlebar or somewhere there. They've got a decent level of wind protection. The seats are Harley touring levels of comfort. They are ridiculously comfortable all day comfort on these bikes. So much more comfortable than a lot of motorbikes. I did eight hour days on Bali's fairly ropey roads on these bikes and we rode all day, every day, commuting, longer distances, supreme machines. But, but can they? 
can they compete as an all-rounder compared to a bike? So, Sean, I checked two here. Uh, I went on to used, on to Auto Trader just to have a look. What can people get for fairly affordable money here if they just want to dip their toe into the water of these maxi scooters? I was surprised what I found. Suzuki Bergman 650. I'll put a pic here up if you don't know it. First of all, I was amazed there's a two, there's a 650 version because I've ridden a 250 around Tenerife with Monaco on the back. Ludicrous levels of comfort. But they do a 650cc version of this bike. So I wanted to do one extreme here. This is a 2013 model. £1,975 used price. 54 horsepower. It's motorcycle levels of power. I know there's a BMW maxi scooter as well, and that's got some ludicrous levels of, uh, of performance as well. But 54 horsepower is seriously impressive. This one's got 41,000 miles on the clock. But at that size engine, with that level of performance, it will keep up with a lot of stuff, and you'll be able to tour around Europe with no issue at all, in absolute comfort. And I'll give one more. This is the, the, the ultimate maxi scooter in Southeast Asia, in Bali. And of course, they'll sell it here in Europe as well. 2010, I found one on Auto Trader. 2010 Yamaha X Max. This you can get for two and a half thousand pounds. It's 20 horsepower. So a huge drop in horsepower, but but it's just a 250cc bike, so it'll probably be a bit more economical. It's got 11,000 <coughs> 11, miles on the clock. And have a look at the plushness of the seat of this. So you get all of the comfort, you get more practicality than a motorbike, and they come in at reasonable prices. They'll also be extremely reliable because they're Japanese. Look, the thing for me is, yes, they will lose out on the cool factor. So jumping on it and having that, that feeling of, oh, I'm riding my, my dream bike from an aesthetic point of view. But take all of that away and just, just condense it down into two-wheeled fun and enjoyment. They're fantastic things. There's a definite place even in Europe, I think, certainly in, in the UK as well, where they're not hugely popular yet, but there's, there's a place for maxi scooters. They make so much sense for commuting. Oh, they're a joy, they're a joy. So anyone share with me, please. Do you have any maxi scooter adventures? Do you swear by maxi scooters now? Because I, I'm with you, Sean. I think there is a, a place for them. Uh, among motorbike riders, I mean, there is a definite place for them and they make a more than a viable alternative to traditional motorcycles. 100%. I think they're fantastic. Moving on. JB in Scotland. Here's a bit of consumer advice. There's one of my favourite biking helmets is the Shoei X0. X0, let me check, I got that, yeah, X0, and I found it for £273 online. That's a really good deal at the moment. But HJC have just come out with a helmet that is meant to be extremely safe, and in my eyes, it looks every bit as good looking as this showy X0 helmet. It's called the HJC V60, and it's £173 right now on sale. 173 pounds. It's 100 pounds cheaper than the showy helmet. Looks every bit as good. From what I've seen is every bit as safe. And it's even got a little flip down visor. So you don't actually have to put goggles on as well. And the visor just sits snugly behind the front chin guard. I think that's a brilliant looking helmet. I'm going to consider one of those. And I move on to one more from JB. The question, do loud pipes save lives? But do they also hurt eardrums? And do open pipes liberate character? What's the sweet spot? I'm loving my new arrows with DB killers removed on the Honda CB 1100 Euro 4, which was such a turning point. But will Euro 5 be the death of motorbike character with even quieter pipes? And is there plan afoot to remove sound and thereby make electric bikes more appealing? JB. Okay, JB, first point. 
Do loud pipes save lives? Honestly, I don't sign up to this. Or maybe I'll correct myself. I'm sure having really loud pipes on a bike does mean that more people will see you, especially if you're filtering through traffic. More people will hear you with loud pipes. But my point of view on this is that if I'm riding around with the loudest pipes possible so everyone can hear me, that's effectively the same as everyone constantly screaming and waving their hands around to, to be seen. And it's too draining all the time. I want to go in not complete silence, but quite close to silence past people. I may have to back off a little bit and accept that, yes, maybe if I had really loud exhausts, more people would see me, but I don't want to be constantly screaming at people so people know I exist on a bike. I would much rather maybe potentially have a tiny bit more danger through people not being quite as aware I'm there because I don't have hugely loud exhausts. But the benefit for me with that is I'm not constantly screaming and making people aware that I'm there because I don't, I don't always want people to, to know I'm there by me having to scream about it. I hope that makes sense. And I know this is really divisive. I think it's probably 50-50 people who like loud pipes and believe that loud pipes save lives. And maybe people like me who find loud pipes a bit too annoying. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Next point, JB. Do open pipes liberate character? What's the sweet spot? And Euro 5, will that be the death of motorbike character with even quieter pipes? See, JB, for me, a bike can be quiet, but still have character. I think loudness and character can be separated. So I separate the loudness, I keep the character. And I think it's a cop-out when biking brands such as Indian come out with bikes such as the vintage dark horse that I rode, and it's got the most atrocious sounding exhaust. Awful. I remember riding a brand new one about three years ago. It's a beautiful looking bike. Oh, it looks the business. It turns heads from about 100 meters away. Huge, all black, matte black bike. 1700cc engine. It, it just, I remember having it in southeast London. People were dropping their Starbucks outside. It was that amazing a bike. I then turn it on. Nothing. Sounds like a 500cc Honda commuter bike. It's a complete disgrace the way that engine sounded. And this is coming from a huge Indian fan. And then you can jump onto a Triumph T100, a Royal Enfield Interceptor, quieter exhausts, but they've got some character there. They've ju got just a hint of character. That's all I need. So I think that the sound can be reduced, but so long as biking companies try hard enough, why can't that character stay? I really honestly believe it. JB, thank you as always. I move on to Tony. Freddie, I'm currently selling my Ducati Scrambler, I'm, Scrambler and I'm looking at the Moto Guzzi V7. I know you love it. I also love the look, the Italianness of it. And I'm riding to Tuscany to meet Natalie in August. What better way than on an Italian bike? But I also like the idea of a smaller bike, for example, Honda CBR300F. What do you think? Or do I already know the answer? Tony. Tony, I may be getting too excited and enthusiastic about biking season being here now. It's well and truly here. It's daytime recording, 1st of May. Maybe it's my excitement talking, but I'm sorry if you're going to Italy and you've got the chance of getting a V7. Oh, Tony, you've got to buy that V7 because the memories made on a Moto Guzzi V7 and riding it to Italy, oh, you make memories to last a lifetime. Have an amazing trip. Move on to Bill and Debbie, Freddie. One more point. Ah, I had to bring this up because I had so many people messaging me about this. I thought it would actually be borderline irresponsible of me if I didn't say this. Have a listen. Freddie, one more point on valve clearances. Whilst it's obviously a personal decision whether to check or not, I would categorically disagree with anyone who says that you can hear when they need adjustment. This is totally untrue. As a valve gets tighter, which generally does the most amount of harm, it will also get quieter. 
regards Bill and Debbie. I could have I could have read out any one of ten of these from Valve clearances. Now, of course, I I know almost nothing about bike mechanics, but seeing the difference of people's opinions with Valve clearances, some saying no need at all, some saying you must religiously stick to it, mechanics saying you can hear if you need to do the Valve clearances. So if I can hear nothing at all, it doesn't need it. Very useful information there. Moving on. Ah, okay, I need to change the tires on the Bonneville. So this is about saving money on tire changes. If you want, okay, I begin here. If you want tires fitted quickly, the best bet is to buy the tires and get them delivered to your door. Then take the wheels off the bike yourself and take the wheels and tires to a dealership or tire fitters in the car. Leave them with the fitters, go for a nice coffee and some grub, a couple of hours later, your fresh rubber will be all sorted and it'll only cost 20 to 30 pounds at most. I'd never thought of this, but a lot of people got in touch. I paid, I think it was about a year ago in London, about 70 pounds to have my bike tires changed. But a lot of people are saying, take the tires off your bike yourself, tires into the boot, take it down 20 to 30 pounds because you've saved so much of the hassle, the time that the garage needs to take off your wheels. It's harder than a car. A car you can take off the wheel in about three minutes or so, but a bike is more difficult. And you can save, let's say you can save about 40 pounds or so. This is from Stephen Kentucky, just a bit about the cost that this is eye-watering, the cost of some tyres on the bigger bikes. This is a Harley. Freddie, changing a set of tyres is a pain in the ass and the wallet. You can probably save some money and time by taking the wheels off. This is echoing exactly the, the comment before. You can save some time and money by taking the wheels off and bringing them instead of the bike to the garage so there's less labour cost. Throw them on the tire machine, balance them, and you're off. Here in Kentucky, to change the tires on my 1998 Harley Davidson Springer would cost $30 a wheel to mount and balance. So that's $30 a wheel to mount and balance, $30 for each new tube, and right now the wide white wall Dunlops that I run cost $200 a piece. So that's around $520 plus tax to change the tires. That's, that's huge. It's got to be about £450 sterling. $520 to change. Um, and that's with, I continue, sorry, that's with bringing just the wheels, not the bike. I grease the bearings, fit the new wheel seals, adjust the rear belt, inspect the brakes, and I'm done for another 15,000 miles. So plenty of time to save up more money to do it again. The crazy thing is that I used to be able to get four tires put in my pickup truck for $200 out the door and they would last 40,000 miles. Yeah, I know bike tires are so hugely expensive. 520 is, is eye-wateringly expensive, Steve. It's a proper amount that you have to save up. I think, what is it for the Bonneville? I'm sure, I remember on my Tramp Speed Triple, it was 270 pounds sterling just for the tires. And they were pretty wide, chunky tires. Fiat 500, I can get a tire for 38 pounds. 38 pounds. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, Freddie. I move on. Morning, Freddie. Have you seen the new Kawasaki W800 Cafe? Amazing looking bike. They're just over £8,000 new, but there are some now. There are now some pre-regged bikes. Zero miles on the clock, £6,500. Robert. Robert, I had to look at this, and you're absolutely right. I went on to Auto Trader. I typed in Kawasaki W800, brand new. So not even a year old, only brand new bikes I wanted to see. And there they are. Lovely looking bike, usually £8,000. Currently, take your pick around the UK, they're £6,499. And that is a stunning looking bike. It's 47 horsepower and it's 773cc. So this, Robert, this puts it bang on. 
bang on. Royal en Enfield Interceptor or Continental 650 GT and, you know, the likes of the BSA Gold Star. This puts this brand new Kawasaki in the price range of the BSAs and the Royal Enfields. I think that is an almost unmissable deal at the moment. So if there's anyone out there looking for a new bike, but for good money, do not miss that opportunity. Six and a half grand for a brand new bike. I s sounds unmissable to me. And I'll wrap up on this one. Freddie, one of my regrets in life would be not holding on to most of the bikes I've had. Not as my only bike, but just to keep for old time's sake. Funds would not allow for the vast majority of the time, and I doubt that any of them would have been a shrewd investment. But just to look at and ride every now and again would bring back the old days. The memories, the smile factor, the eclectic motorcycle ownership journey through the years, the progression from speed is everything through to I'm going to either lose my license or lose my life and all the way through to the comfort trumps everything. Maybe I should start looking at buying some of them again. Most are worth nothing now, but a few would be quite expensive, I believe. Mind you, I'd need a pretty big barn too. I'm a firm believer in it doesn't matter what you ride as long as it puts a smile on your face. My parting piece of advice would be Never let your gravestone include the words, I wish I had done that, or if only I had. Keep the shiny side up, Richard. Richard, it's a perfect way to end. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to this week's episode. Have a superb week. I'll see you all in the next one.